the studies of the Veda was for me the major thing. And uh, I wanted to see the shift of paradigms from Vedic to Upanishadic and later to what I call Sankhyaic paradigm of Sankhya and Yoga and Darshanas. And actually, Gita is already in that paradigm of mental structure of consciousness, if I would use Gipsavich. And um, why I wanted to do that, I wanted to see the lineage, I wanted to see the development of the same thought. And Sri Aurobindo did this work, and he says it, it was the same Vedic thought was developed, or how to say, narrowed down, or presented in different terms. First in the intuitive terms of mental structure in the Upanishads, and later in the mental structure of Darshanas. And the Gita, Gita has completely mental language and deals with concepts. It's another type of, or another way of presenting the same spiritual knowledge. Uh, so what I found interesting that the Veda is, first I thought Veda was representing some kind of magic, mythical structure, you know, even less mythical, more magic, more fundamentally archaic, Again, in Gibsarian terms. As Shubindu says, uh, Veda belongs to symbolic age. But later I noticed that Veda is not totally archaic or magic only. It has very sophisticated and highly developed conceptual language. So language which is uh, not fitting into the magic structure of, you know, curses and uh, all kinds of taboos, uh, which we sometimes find uh, here and there in the literature, in Atharva Veda, for example. It's another type, very highly developed, very... And I started to think what it could be, really, where it comes from. And then I realized that, actually, Veda is presented to every Manvantara, according to, to the Indian tradition. Every Manvantara starts with Satya Yuga and goes down to Kali Yugas, you know. And these are Maha Yugas, within which there are also Yugas. So it's like fourfold division within fourfold division. So it always narrows down to the physical perception, to the most physical and external, from the most, so to say, profound and... Uh, symbolic perception of things where the spirit and matter are one and then they slowly are disengaged and discriminated and finally they are presented as two different uh, aspects of the same reality and at the end we have only one that is material objective where the mental structure dominates by the way, mental structure operates only within this objective perception of things. Ourselves, perce perceiving ourselves as objective entities. It's quite interesting. Mental structure does not operate totally and, uh, to say, exclusively within the structure where there is spirit still present. But I will not uh, lead you too far into that. What I want to say that the Veda was for me a um, puzzle. And for many scholars also in the West, it is still a puzzle because they do not know how to deal with it. It, it must be some kind of stone age or barbaric you know, origin of some kind. And at the same time, it has the highest possible poetry available to us, to mankind today. With the most developed and sophisticated poetic language and poetry, chandas of no comparison to anything which was produced later. So, how come? There is a contradiction to this barbaric beginnings and this highly sophisticated and developed mentality which is already, which is not exclusively mental, but has some other dimensions which our mind refuses to see. So, and then I understood that actually uh, what uh, Indian tradition presents is another perception of time and uh, involvement of 
mankind, so to say, the evolutionary process is seen differently, not in terms of linear, yeah, as we see it today, that from the single uh, amoeba organisms, uh, there were more, more and more complicated development, and finally we come to man, and man goes on. It's a linear way of seeing evolution, where we see evolution only from the perspective of physicality, of physical development, of physical instruments, which includes vital and mental. Mind is also part of this physicality. That's what Matthias was referring to, that when we deal with these instruments of knowledge, we are dealing still with prakriti, and it can't be otherwise. So the, this way of seeing evolution is not presented in the Indian tradition. In the Indian tradition, it is seen from the point of view of the involvement of the group soul. And that group soul is called Manu. That's why Manvantaras, periods of Manu involvement. And who is Manu? Is the mental being. Mm -hmm. Mental in a Vedic sense, not in the later sense. The being which has the mind of free will. Aham Manur Abhavam Suryasya. Listen to this verse, what Vamadeva says. I became Manu. I became the sun. Manu. The sun. So, this um, higher being of this group soul, which every time brings some kind of plan, how to get engaged with the manifestation. <laughs> so to say. It's a uh, fascinating view. Uh, is presented in the Veda. So Veda is, every time new Veda is given to every, this period of Manvantara starts with the most luminous knowledge of what is to be done and slowly by doing it comes down to that point where it cannot be done anymore. There is no more energy to do it. The resistance of the darkness of the inconscience is so great that the resources are already exhausted. Kali Yuga, the end of Kali Yuga. Then Pralaya takes time, so the soul, group soul disengages, withdraws, makes another plan, another vision of involvement, including all those perspectives and all those failures and all those impossibilities into the plan, new Veda, so to say, is projected and brought again into a new Manvantara. Why I'm saying all this, it's kind of mythological uh, vision, but what is interesting about it is that since Veda is presented for the whole period, it must reflect all the structures of consciousness. And it is in a way very true. Veda reflects all the structures, including mental, the most mental uh, development. And in that sense, it's, um, it is integral in a way. Only we cannot see it because we are predominantly mental. And we are working out this mentality more and more, as Matthias said. We have to really have a, um, how to say, well-developed, sharp instrument with which we then, getting back all those other structures we, which we neglected by developing this mental and making them transparent and making them uh, efficient within the mental structure or together with mental structure, may have a glimpse of that what Veda was. And by the way, we started to see this slowly, studying the Veda for several years, in IPI, we started to see that it is more sophisticated than it looked like at the beginning. At the beginning, it was like a religious literature of some kind, you know, worshipping gods of different kind. But later, we saw that... And of course, there is much more to it, because all these devatas, all these godheads, they represent uh, specific uh, uh, powers of universal consciousness. We can say that the Veda is the psychology of the universals. 
not of the individuals. It doesn't deal with individuals in a proper sense. It deals with the universal movements which are applicable to all individuals. And that's why it, uh, it is, uh, when we study Veda, it is dear to all of us. There is no uh, religious preference of any kind. It's not a Hindu literature. It's not against any other Muslim or Christian literature or any other literature. It's universal in its approach, uh, very yogic uh, in its content or in its methodology. And it is far beyond everything we achieved on the level of uh, spiritual re realization. Far beyond. So far as uh, we can say that, as Mother says about Rishis, that they are involutionary beings. If we are all evolutionary beings evolving here out of matter into the spirit, these beings are not evolutionary. They came down with a higher knowledge, like avatars bring knowledge down for the humanity to have it, to remember what was the purpose of coming here and to fulfill that plan. So we are fulfilling the plan of the Veda, whether we want it or not, whether we know about it or not. And that's how Sri Aurobindo says that the Veda was our beginning and the Veda will be our end. Everything is there, the whole plan. It looks like we are doing something else, maybe, you know, according to our individual perception of things. But truly speaking, we are working out this projection of the group soul to which we belong. So the, the concept of time in the Veda was seen in cyclic terms, yeah? not in the linear terms, of the involvement of the soul and then coming out of that involvement. It's like we can compare it to the individual. Individual is born. First he is a child, everything is beautiful, symbolic age. And then he becomes more and more mental, more and more worried. Then he gets old and then he leaves the body. In the same way these cycles for the group soul were envisioned. That's why the, uh, the, uh, in Indian tradition the, the, the names were never important. Copyrights were never important. There are hundreds of works of Kalidasa and actually there are only a dozen works which are originally Kalidasas, but everyone w wanted to, to sign with his name, forgetting his own. So this, this is the same applicable to the whole tradition. There was never a rigorous, historic, event-oriented, linear structure, because that was understood as cycles of involvement of the soul 